Little VC. Thought um, today we'd talk about a couple of bands, maybe a little bit more on the on the heavy side of things. I was watching uh, and the issue of metal and hard rock kind of came up and and the importance of all that in music and music history. I certainly think it has a important and prominent role to play. And it would be a mistake to dismiss it too easily. But along those lines, there's a band that I think just, um, I, don't, I don't hear them getting mentioned that much. And I think certainly when it comes to 90s music, that I think were probably one of the most influential hard rock bands, if not metal, um, that came out. And it's flashing back a little bit to that whole, to the, uh, you know, the desert rock scene. They call it desert rock. And uh, in a band that I think maybe the premier hard rock band to come out of the 90s to me was um, Caius. And uh, these are, they still sound fantastic. These are great records. And they've got something that I think a lot of hard rock bands seem to forget about, which is uh, they have soul and they have groove. And Caius was a band that uh, um, had a reason for having an extended track that would go on for a while because they locked into a groove that, um, you know, just wouldn't quit. And the repetition of the sound um, kept that pace of that music moving forward and gave the song and the track some place to go, a purpose. Um, so I think these, maybe especially this one, were vitally important to what later went on to become, you know, stoner rock. And I hear a lot of people mention uh, Sleep or even bands like Clutch. Um, and I really feel like they all, you know, if you really want to find the beginning of that, you know, that stoner sound, that, um, that this was, this was their, before them and doing it, not only there before them, but doing it in a better way. Doing it in a way that, that brought in the best of the past and uh, incorporated the new sounds. And, uh, and, and, and I think it's an, another overlooked band that they got some of that, that groove from. When I think about the bands of the 70s who, uh, who those kids, well, they're not kids anymore. Neither are any of us, right? But uh, where that came from was another band um, that I think gets overlooked sometimes. And that's Grand Funk. And uh, they, you know, they easily get dismissed because, uh, you know, they had some hits in the 70s, maybe some more embarrassing hits in the 70s. But if you look back at these early, when they were a three-piece, look back at this early Grand Funk music, and you can see the development of the groove that later came out, you know, here. And really only a couple of records, if you go back into the Grand Funk catalog to look at. Um, Grand Funk Live, I think. And the first two albums that they did, again, as a three-piece, but really this one. If you want to find one, you can still find this record cheap. There's a lot of them in this area. Um, Grand Funk was from Flint, Michigan, and uh, they were named after a, a Grand Trunk Railroad. 
which was a railroad, an important railroad to the Michigan auto industry at one time. And, uh, but these guys, these, these three stoners from Michigan, uh, they did more than just make hard rock music. They locked into gro a groove that would last 10 minutes or 15 minutes and not be boring. Um, uh, how can I put this in a diplomatic way? There are a lot of progressive rock bands that I think um, have songs that go on for, for 10 minutes or 15 minutes. And I, I, I can't find a point for it. I can't find a groove to it. And it just, it doesn't do anything for me. And that's not to put down anyone or, or anything. It's just, I think that when you're gonna make songs that go on, you gotta have a purpose. Um, the Krautrock bands of the 70s, they had a purpose for a nine minute song. Grand Funk Railroad had a purpose, especially live, for a nine minute song. They locked into a groove and they synced it up with the song and just hammered it. And you can really see it. There's some live tracks if you go online and uh, and there's a live there's a live version of got this thing on a move. And if you want to see a crowd reacting to the band, um, there's nothing better. Um, you have to go look for it and, and see it. Once they lock into that groove, and you can start to see these all these kids from the 70s, just their eyes are lighting up because they know they're hearing and seeing something that's just connecting on a on another level, uh, dare I say spiritual level, because I think ultimately music does connect on a spiritual level. And then they, they're they viscerally re reacting to that, that sound and that groove. And that's the same thing, there's a good documentary on, on, uh, on Desert Rock that bands like Caius locked into that same, same sound and that same groove. And um, if people aren't, and I, and I know that there are people out there that know about Caius and, and uh, they're, you know, an important band, but I don't think they, they uh, seem to be getting lift, looked over and for bands like Sleep and for uh, um, other bands that maybe, maybe took it to another extreme or had the gimmick of, you know, marijuana smoking or, or, or whatever, but... Um, without Caius, to me, uh, that stone of rock, you know, you could say it came from Sabbath and from, you know, that, that doom sound is where they, where they got it. But Caius took the Sabbath sound and mixed it with Grand Funk Railroad, with that groove. And that's where the magic comes from on these records, in my, in my humble estimation. Um, and from that, you know, we get the band that's still around today. Now, I am, uh, you know, I think Queens of the Stone Age were great, but it's these early albums that I think were, to me, the best, where they kind of continued um, what Caius was doing um, and just took it to, a, to another level. These uh, first couple of Queens of the Stone Age records, I remember hearing them on the radio, on, on Detroit radio at the time, and uh, and really uh, um, feel good song, feel good hit of the summer. Um, fantastic, fantastic groove, but condensing it more into a song, into a hit, and uh, without losing the personality of the music. Um, really, really excellent stuff. So. If you're not familiar with these early Queen albums, or if you're not familiar with, you know, certainly the the, the last three Caius albums, the first one I'm not as much of a fan of. It's good, and it has its fans, but it's these three that I think really need to be acknowledged and recognized. 
I always had these on uh, CD. So when they get a reissue of them on vinyl, I'll warn you that I don't, to be honest, I don't think the vinyl sounds as good as the CD does. Um, I think they lost something in the bass frequency. I don't know what it was or how they did it, but uh, they still sound good. And uh, if you find these, you can usually find them pretty inexpensive. I think they're still in print. Um, but check them out, they're really good. And if you wanna go back and explore a little further, don't forget to remember that it wasn't just Black Sabbath that they took influences from, or that even the stoner scene just took influences from. But go back and, and listen to some of the grooves, especially on this record and on the live record, where uh, where I think a lot of that hard rock groove that still had the soul, still had the, the feel without becoming, um, and without becoming too robotic, without becoming too much of a, a mechanism where it still had heart and feel and, and uh, soul to it. And, um, and I think that that came from, from Grand Funk. So anyway, uh, hope everyone's well. And thanks, you see.